The Nigerian Economic Summit has proved uh, to be resilient in promoting dialogue and collaboration <clears throat> between government and the private sector. This has led to a number of very worthy initiatives and joint interventions over the years. It's also an opportunity, a regular opportunity for us to review the conditions and policies that impact on overall economic performance and to collaboratively interrogate some of the important ideas and prescriptions preferred for the Nigerian economy. This address will be devoted essentially to an aspect of the theme of the summit, from poverty to prosperity, making governance and institutions work. The focus is on charting the course from poverty to prosperity for the majority. Absolute poverty is defined as the number of those who cannot afford the bare essentials, food, shelter, clothing. Sometimes the World Bank says those who live under a dollar ninety. But this has become, by and large, especially over the past three decades, perhaps the biggest economic challenge for Nigeria. What is astonishing about the poverty situation is that it has persisted even when the nation earned its highest revenues. The MBS figures published of its household poverty surveys in 2012, which was the last uh, survey done, showing, showing that despite rising oil prices and growth figures, poverty increased in every study cycle. I'll just share some of the figures with you very quickly. In 1980, absolute poverty figures, that's the absolute numbers, was 17.1 million Nigerians. In 1985, 34.7 million Nigerians. In 1992, 39.2 million. 1996, 67.1 million. 2004, 66.7 million. 2010, which is the last household survey of poverty done, 112.47 million. The figures for the next cycle are currently being compiled by the MBS. But the, the truth is that despite you know, uh, what would appear to be rising revenues, especially oil revenues, poverty has remained more or less stagnant. And in fact, in the period between 2004 and 2010, doubled actually in, in absolute numbers. The problem of poverty and the attendant deficits in human development indices becomes more significant because our population continues to grow at about 3% annually and we are to become the world's most populous nation by 2050. But, but the world's third, sorry, third most populous nation by 2050. Of this population, over 60% will be young people and about 1.4 million entering the job market every year. But how do we explain the paradox of high growth figures and rising poverty and unemployment figures? The first explanation is that high oil revenues do not necessarily translate to jobs. The oil industry by itself produces very few jobs. The high revenues can only translate to jobs and better living standards if the revenues are invested in diversification of the economy, infrastructure, education, and healthcare and social protection for those who cannot work. The question, of course, is what happens to these revenues? How come we're unable to use the revenues in the way that they ought to be used? The most important drain on our resources is grand corruption, the stealing of large sums of public resources by public officials in collaboration with private individuals. I use the expression grand corruption to describe the direct looting of the treasury not necessarily tied to any government contract. This is, in essence, state capture. It is this heinous phenomenon that the Buhari administration has worked on to stop. What happens with grand corruption is that by diverting government revenues to private use, resources are not available to be invested in the manner that they are planned to benefit everyone, to benefit the majority of people. No economy can survive on the theft of the Commonwealth by its custodians. Impossible. And we must address 
the questions, especially of grand corruption, squarely. It's a different thing, and, 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 and I distinguish between grand corruption and any other kind of corruption, and we'll probably get a chance to talk about that in the plenary session on corruption. That's a different thing where government contracts are given out, and there's corruption in the cause of execution of government contracts. That is different from losing. That is different from what we see. It is different from taking the resources where it really is and simply diverting them. It is that type of corruption, that grand corruption, that has bedeviled this country and has led to the kinds, uh, has led to the kinds of resource drains that have refused us the kind of momentum that we ought to have in our economy. The second reason that explains the paradox of high growth figures and rising poverty and unemployment flows from, this, from the first, namely the poor investment in infrastructure and the creation of an enabling env environment for business. The third is the lack of commitment to diversification of the economy, which would of course in turn provide multiple streams of revenue. This is both a problem at the national and at the sub-national level. We have seen how the state's total dependence on monthly uh, FAC allocations has led to a situation where few states can pay salaries without federal government, without the, without the FAC. Yearly IGR in most states cannot pay their wages, their wage bills in one month. Nigeria's productive economy is the sum total of 36 states and the FCT where the states do not have enough private commercial activity, even agriculture, to generate sufficient IGR, job creation is stifled and poverty deepens. The fourth reason that explains the paradox of high growth figures and rising poverty and unemployment figures is the low investment over the years in the businesses at the bottom of the pyramid, the so-called informal sector. And, uh, and we heard uh, the last speaker speak about this so-called informal sector and why we need to recognize it and invest in it. The approach of the current government to reversing poverty and its consequences originated from the debates at the manifesto drafting stage in which I had the privilege of participating. The two classic sides at play were those who felt that so long as we created a sufficiently enabling environment for businesses, for the formal sector to thrive, we would create enough jobs and opportunities for all. There was no need for a massive welfare scheme and no need for direct government creation of jobs. It always, according to the argument, leads to dependency and it is unsustainable. The other argument and the one that prevailed was that while we supported a private sector-led economy, we had to intentionally address the creation of economic opportunities for the bottom of the pyramid, for the poorest. We, all, we were also convinced that governments still had to create some jobs directly, especially for the large number of people coming out of tertiary institutions and who, of course, have no immediate opportunities. So a major premise of our economic model was the focus on empowering the jobless youth and millions in extreme poverty by a mix of microcredit schemes, infrastructure support for markets and small business clusters, and welfare for the most vulnerable and the direct creation of jobs on a consistent basis. In sum, our focus has and will continue to be job creation. We've also decided that our focus will be on the following. One, ensuring that at least 30% of budget is spent on capital, especially infrastructure. To quote two uh, leading Nigerian economists, as growth in public capital expenditure rises, unemployment falls, and the Human Development Index improves. Therefore, infrastructure-based policies, which initially reduce unemployment, will also improve the living conditions. Two, diversifying the economy, especially agriculture, mining, and the promotion of MSMEs. Three, strong fiscal discipline, especially zero tolerance for grand corruption. Four, support to states for payments of salaries and emoluments. And five, a social protection program covering at least five million of the poorest in its first phase. Most of these 
most of these points were captured in detail in our economic recovery and growth plan. Generally speaking, we have tried to keep faith with these objectives. By putting in place a stricter regime of fiscal discipline, we provided for 30% capital expenditure from 2016, despite earning over 60% less than in the previous four years. We invested so far a total of 2.7 trillion in capital spend, the highest ever in the history of the country. This covers investments in rail, in roads, in power, and in dams. In diversifying the economy, agriculture has been a major success story with increasing budgetary allocation to agriculture from 8.8 .8 billion in 2015 to 46.2 billion in 2016 and 1.03 billion in this particular cycle. Through the Anchor Borrowers uh, Program, credit is given directly to smallholder farmers and the Anchor Borrowers Program is an agricultural program for financing smallholder farmers. And the CBN and 13 other participating banks have so far given credit totaling 120.6 billion naira. And this has been given to 720,000 smallholder farms who cultivate 12 commodities so far, including rice, wheat, cotton, soya, cassava, poultry, and groundnuts across the 36 states and the FCT. In addition, we launched uh, a fertilizer program to improve local blending capacity in collaboration with uh, the Kingdom of Morocco. Today, we have 11 fertilizer blending plants with a capacity for 2.1 million metric tons. Price has dropped fertilizer per bag from about 13,000 and hovers anywhere between 5 and 7,000 naira per bag. The Anchor Boros program is now digitized we have all farmlands, uh, GPRS mapped, biometric data of farmers is captured, electronic cards are issued, and specific inputs are required. This has enhanced traceability and enhanced uh, productivity and yield also. Today, but for a few drawbacks, we are confidently approaching self-sufficiency in rice production. From importing $5 million of rice every single day, official imports are now down to 2%. And if you note, I said official imports are down to 2%. We have paid attention to supporting the state through loans. Paris Club refunds owed since 2005 and budget support facilities totaling 1.9 trillion naira so far have been given to the states in one form of support or the other. The simple reason being to ensure that consumer spending in the states does not suffer even more. On assumption of office in 2015, over 20 states were owing salaries for periods ranging from 3 to 12 months. For most states, the regular income of civil servants is a critical part of the economy of those states. A major plan of uh, our administration's plan to move the needle positively on the poverty numbers is the social investment program. Our social investment program is the largest and most ambitious social investment program in the history of our country. We provided 500 billion for it in both the 2016 and 2017 budgets. But the total spend on the program so far in both cycles is clo closer to 250 billion, and that's from both budgets. The program has six components. The Empire program, which is our graduate employment scheme, and this is the largest post-tertiary jobs project in Africa. 500,000 graduates have been recruited as teachers, agricultural extension workers, and as public health officials. The last batch of 300,000 were recruited at the end of August. Each of these volunteers is provided with an electronic tablet. The first 200,000 have been provided. We're yet to provide the remaining 300,000. And this electronic tablet contains relevant training materials, including some for which they are trained to provide required services on an ongoing basis. So the teachers have training materials for teachers. The, farm, the extension workers in the farms have training materials for uh, extension work on the farms. And we've also trained several of them in various aspects of, of extension work. And in addition, in each of those tablets, we have a wide range of training materials from which uh, the, the beneficiaries 
uh, can, from which the beneficiaries can train and, and use for their own self-development. The device empowers them to participate in the digital economy as data collectors and as analysts. And we, we've seen, you know, especially uh, from the Empire program, we've seen that a lot of the beneficiaries of the Empire program, a lot of these young graduates, have been, you know, very enterprising, and they themselves have gone out to do all sorts of various uh, other, other things for themselves, which uh, some of the training and the tabletry they receive has enabled them to do. Our government enterprise and empowerment program, which is just called GEEP, uh, is a program where we have given out so far over 15 billion in interest-free loans, ranging from 50,000 to 350,000. And this has been disbursed to more than 300,000 market women, traders, artisans, and farmers across the country, including the FCT. 56% of those loans have gone to women. The trade and money program, that's uh, different from the, uh, what we call the market money, which is 50,000 to 350,000. Now this is an important component of giving microcredit to the bottom of the trading pyramid, the smallest businesses, the one table trader, the bread or plantain seller, or the meshai or mesuya, and all of the very small traders. Most of them, their total inventory is not even usually up to about 5,000 naira. So if you look at their trades, if you look at what they're selling, most don't sell, uh, don't have an inventory of up to 5,000 naira at any given point in time. When I went to launch the scheme at the Yaya market, there's a woman who was selling her homo, which uh, for those who do not uh, indulge in that delicacy, is the hide of, of a cow, you know. But it, it is a delicacy, you know. And I, everyone is pretending that they don't know what homo means. I really am. <laughs> but, so this lady had her homo in a bucket, you know, just a bucket, and it had water in it. And I asked her how much it was. She said it was about 3,000 naira. They told everything there was about 3,000 naira. So I said to her, okay, so what is your profit? How do you make profit from this? And she pointed to the woman who was standing right next to her. The woman who was standing right next to her had her own kwamo in a little bowl, you know. And she just pointed to her like, I'm a big player here. <laughs> Look at this one. So it's very clear that these uh, a lot of these people are really the bottom of the pyramid, but they are hardworking. They are in that value chain making their contributions. And, we, and, and one, of the, uh, one of the ways by which we thought we could really add some value to that is by enabling them to buy more, improving their inventory so they can improve their own capacity to earn. Most of them, as I've said, are the small, uh, they, they, they are these last in that value chain. They sell the single sachets of soap, sugar, spices, and all of that to the largest numbers of people. But they are forgotten and ignored in economic plans and budgets. And they are considered too unwieldy and too risky for microcredit loans. And so under the scheme, we're giving microcredit to about 2 million of these petty traders across the country. And the scheme enables them to draw further credit if they're able to pay back within six months. What we found is that a lot of these small traders, you know, first we're able to reach them, technology has enabled us to reach them through mobile phones. Many who do not have mobile phones share a single mobile phone and have several SIMs. But we're also looking at how this would expand, uh, how, how we can actually expand financial inclusion. And on account of this, we've been able to open about 349,000 new bank accounts. And we are working with about uh, between six and ten, I think, of the, of the banks to be able to open bank accounts uh, for many of these individuals so that they can have more access, you know, uh, more access to credit, more access to financial trading, and, and, all, of what, uh, and all of what have been in the formal uh, economy would provide for them. So we give them a stronger chance to earn more while they also service the value chains uh, which they, they already, which they're already a part of. But more importantly, I think, we bring them into, that form, into the formal sector and where they have access to more government patronage. Uh, I, I want to say also that aside from 
what the beneficiaries have gained. You know, and I've talked already about uh, the new bank accounts and all that. I think that we're also in a position to see who, what exactly, and to study our informal sector a bit better. One of the problems we've had is with collection of taxes, at, especially of a very, very large informal sector. But bringing in several into that, into the net, into the formal sector, would of course enable us to improve even on our very low uh, tax to GDP uh, ratio, which is about, well, it's now close to 8%, it used to be about 6%. So to, we, we've also tried, in, in, as part of uh, enabling the informal sector, we've tried to provide infrastructure for small economic clusters and markets. And this we've done through our Energizing Economies project providing solar power to markets and economic clusters for small businesses and petty traders. In our area market in Abba, we provided solar power for over 31,000 shops. In Sabongari market in Kano, we provided uh, solar power for over 13,598 shops. We're opening Sura market in Lagos uh, on Friday, where we're providing, um, where we're providing for over 1,000 shops in the first place. We're also going to be doing Balogun Market uh, in Lagos and with Baggy Market in Oyo. We've done in Undo State about three markets already, Seacom Market, Nepal 1 and 2, where we've done close to a thousand shops as well. In total, we've given solar power to about 81,691 shops and we've serviced over 320,000 MSMEs. Our small businesses, of course, are a focus of our economic plans. So our MSME clinics, taking regulators to the MSME, MSMEs in, the, in all the states of the Federation. We've gone to 20 states so far. And we've also, in, in the process, set up one-stop shops for regulatory and business approvals in several of those states. Just to quickly explain that, what we've done uh, with the MSMEs is that we've actually gone from state to state with our regulators. So we have NAFDAQ, we have SOM, we have DOI uh, for, for credit policy, we have the Corporate Affairs Commission, and several of the other uh, regulators and business approval agencies. And we actually take them to these states where we have these interactions over a two-day period with the, with the MSMEs in those states. The idea, of course, is to ensure that the regulators are better able to understand the problems and the issues that the MSMEs have. And what we've done in some states is to then set up one-stop shops in those states. So you have under one roof, we have most of the regulatory authorities under one roof, so that the small businesses don't have to travel long distances to NAFDAQ or SOM and, and all of that. And, we've, uh, and in some of the states where uh, we've set up the one-stop shops in Cross River State, in uh, Oshun State, in Plateau State, you know. And in some states we've also established uh, and equipped facilities where we have uh, shared facilities for small businesses. So for example, for uh, tailors or for very small businesses such as that, we actually provide a facility which is, which is registered by the state government, has required approvals and all of that, equipped with uh, whatever equipment there, there need to be, machines and all of that, and power so that small businesses in those clusters can use the facilities without necessarily, and paying a small fee and without necessarily having to register again and do all of the various things that an individual business may need to do. We've done that in Abia, in Anambra, in Kaduna, and in Oyo State. So, so, uh, so by and large, we've tried to focus on, on the MSMEs and of the 20 states I've been to about 18, I've gone to 18 of those states along with the regulators. And one of the things that you consistently find is that there's a huge number of individuals who are doing their businesses and groups who are doing their businesses, but who just have problems with the regulatory authorities, who have problems with NAFTA, have problems with SON and all of that. And we're, and we're happy to say that NAVDAC now has cleared, uh, using uh, technology, has cleared its backlog of over 5,000 applications. And part of that is because they've been able to see for themselves what the MSMEs are going through, and the MSMEs have confronted them with their problems. As part of our social investment programs, our homegrown school feeding program, which provides a free balanced meal 
to over 9.2 million children in public primary schools every day. The program is operational now in 26 states. And by using local produce, livestock, and poultry, we support local agriculture, provide jobs for, at the moment, 95,440 cooks resident in the various communities in which the schools are located. And they, of course, are the you know, employees of the program. We pay them directly. The cooks are paid directly by the, by the federal government. We have their BDNs, we have their bank accounts. And they deal with the individual schools. So we have cooks in the schools in every local government. The program is designed to improve malnutrition outcomes and also to improve school enrollment. And of course, to provide, because the homegrown school feeding program, we buy produce locally. All of the produce that is used is, of course, uh, bought locally, which enables, which also uh, helps uh, the farming, uh, the farming in any of the lo localities where we have the homegrown school feeding program. Our conditional cash transfer program, under which we have, we pay five thousand monthly to the poorest and most vulnerable households in the country, on the condition that they participate in educational, health, and nutritional and some environmental activities. So far, we've covered about 300,000 households, and our target under the first phase is 1 million households. We're assisted in this by the World Bank that helps with admiration. The local communities and the World Bank and our staff actually identify the individuals who are considered the poorest community by community. It's been a very slow process. Where we had thought we'd be able to get to the 1 million mark by the end of the year. But our projections show that we'll only be able to do as much as 700,000 by the end of the year. In addition to creation of jobs, two other issues are critical to resolving the poverty problem. The first is education, and the second is healthcare. Improved educational outcomes are crucial to our overall strategy to end extreme poverty, to reduce inequality, and remain on the path of sustainable growth. UNESCO's Global uh, Education Monitoring Report and the Education Commission's Learning Center Generation Report say that there, are, there is important evidence of the impact of education on the individual's earnings, on economic growth, and in particular, they find that education actually reduces poverty, increases individual earnings, and reduces economic inequalities, and promotes economic growth. By their estimates, 171 million people could be lifted out of extreme poverty if all children left school with basic reading skills. That's equivalent to a 12% drop in the total, and that's in the world total. Absolute poverty could be reduced by 30% from learning improvements as outlined by the uh, Education Commission. Now, the, 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 the point also, one of the major challenges that we have, and this has been outlined severally, is population growth and the massive population growth that we're, that we're experiencing about 3% yearly. But one of the outcomes of the studies that have been done on education is that by educating women in particular, by educating girls in particular, we could actually reduce uh, our population growth by about half, just by educating women. And I think that that's the focus, which, and that, that's an issue which, can, which we are focused on and looking at how exactly to ensure that the constraints, the cultural constraints, religious constraints, and all of those kinds of constraints are dealt with so that we can educate the largest numbers of women and also address at the same time uh, the population figures, which we see you know, can become a major problem, although of course it could be an advantage. First is achieving the educational outcomes specified in the Sustainable Development Goals. The targets for school enrollment, targets for quality of education, adult literacy, and the quality of teaching by 2030. Second, we are undertaking an ambitious program to get the 9 million out-of-school children back to school. It's a complex process requiring the full cooperation of state governments, religious authorities, as well as resources to build the schools and equip them properly and train the required number of teachers. One thing we found, we, 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 we've held a summit recently with all of the state governors under the uh, umbrella of the National Economic Council 
to look at how to address these problems, especially problems of out-of-school children. And many of the conclusions we've reached, many of the implementable ideas that we've reached, we're already rolling out so that we can see to a, a drastic reduction in the numbers of uh, children who are out of school. Our school feeding program is already leading to improved enrollment. And the Empire program also can be a source of the initial requirement for teachers. Three, our rapidly increasing population. The phenomenal achievements in technology you know, and this uh, our population has changed the educational challenge before us quite radically. Given our limited resources and the current gaps in educational attainment in our country, it's clear that we must change both the substance of education that our children receive and the methods by which they are taught. We identified early stage investment in primary and secondary education as key to becoming a knowledge-driven economy. There's also general agreement about the importance of STEAM education as opposed to STEM in Nigeria, you know, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And the need for a workforce with STEAM skills to drive economic prosperity. We also have held you know, uh, several meetings, and uh, some may have attended the education summit, where we looked in detail at some of, the, uh, some of these issues, especially uh, the introduction of science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics into our curriculum in primary and secondary schools. We also recognize that schooling should support the development of skills in cross-disciplinary, critical and creative thinking, problem-solving, digital technologies, all of which are essential in all of the 21st century occupations. Set against Nigeria's desire for a strong, functional STEAM education, is the fact that decades of neglect of basic schooling infrastructure and adequate teacher training must be matched by a focused investment in large-scale and innovative solutions that overleap our current conditions. The federal government's program aims to introduce in-class skills development on functional economic and interpersonal skills around uh, STEAM, the STEAM subjects that I've talked about. A countrywide curriculum is in development with coding, digital arts, design thinking, robotics, robotics, critical thinking, and other skills taken into account. And this content is currently being developed in partnership with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, the Oracle Academy, Microsoft, Cisco Academy, and IBM, all of whom uh, have agreed and are working with us in developing uh, this new curriculum. For improved health outcomes in the health sector, we are similarly exploring options for radical reform by ensuring that health gets at least an 8% share of any increases in government spending and by ensuring that the recently operationalized basic health care provision fund is used to substantially increase health care finances. We are also moving aggressively to change that perverse relationship between primary and tertiary healthcare, which attracts almost the same level of funding. So between primary and tertiary healthcare, today we have almost the same level of funding, but we think that this is wrong. And so we're looking at a 60% for primary healthcare, 20% for secondary, and 20% for tertiary uh, uh, healthcare in the allocation of funds. Universal health insurance is a fundamental policy of the federal government. And we believe that using co-payments in order to share the cost between individuals, the private sector and government, while the poorest 40% will be exempted from, paying such, uh, from making such co-payments. By this means, we hope that we can get a 45% increase in the share of the population covered by primary health care in the next four years, up from the present 12.6%. So keeping a similar, a similar level of ambition, we should have 98% coverage in the next 15 years. By similar means, the total government expenditure on health should increase from 7.8 billion in the next four years, as compared to the current level of 5.3%. Uh, this year alone, the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund contributed an additional 55 billion to health financing. The real issue is that we must increase the aggregate national health expenditure. 
In 2017, the health budget of all of the 36 states was a little over 332 billion naira, which is about 4.9% of the total budget size. This year, only Bauchi State has met the 15% target of the Abuja Conference, and the Abuja Conference was where African Union countries pledged to set a target of at least 15% of their annual budgets to improve the health sector. So as far as subnationals go, we expect that there, should be an, that there should be increased funding in the healthcare sector. And we've looked at this as part of our human capital development, uh, the, the, the meetings that we've held with uh, uh, the states. And we're looking at how, the, working with the state governments, we can, uh, we can increase individual spend, healthcare spend of our states. This year, for the first time, the federal government met its 1% of the annual budget prescribed by the Health Act. So for the very first time, we're spending 1% of the budget, which is the recommendation, uh, recommendation of the Health Act. But that is, that is of course, uh, very, very small in comparison to the actual needs uh, of, of, of the healthcare uh, sector. Improved health outcomes, of course, will entail greater cooperation with the private sector. As greater demand arising from health insurance will cause more high-quality private hospitals to be built. Already, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund has invested about $10 million to build a world-class cancer treatment center in Lagos. I think that, by and large, in terms of policy and praxis, you know, critical for us is a technology-driven future. And in the past two years, we have spent quite a bit of time and quite a bit of resources looking at how to prepare for that technology-driven future. We've launched one of the most aggressive drives for promoting business in the tech space. We've partnered with local and international tech companies and innovators in the building of tech hubs and promoting innovation. Our aim is to democratize access to support for innovation and cyber commerce and to create jobs. We've established hubs in collaboration with the World Bank and the Lagos Business School, we established the Climate Change Hub in, uh, at the LBS in Lagos. In Yola, we established the Northeast Humanitarian Hub. It's also a technology hub focusing on innovative solutions for dealing with humanitarian, the different humanitarian challenges. We've also, in collaboration with Civic Hub, uh, which is an Abuja-based hub, promoted technology and innovation in universities with Students' Innovation Challenge in the six geopolitical zones. And we're building technology hubs in three universities. The Unilag Hub, we hope, will be ready by the end of this year. The Bank of Industry, in response to the direction set by the government, has launched a 10 billion naira tech fund. We believe that technology, like entertainment and the arts, requires our active support, especially in the development of policies as we engage on chartered territory in the coming years. Consequently, the president directed that we establish a technology and creativity advisory group to work on and to formulate policies in these very uh, dynamic spaces. So far, we've held about three meetings. We held one last week. And most of those who participate in the advisory group are players in, in, in technology and, and the entertainment industry. Uh, perhaps as I close, uh, the greatest challenge through the years has been governance and institutional witnesses. Systemic corruption, integrity, and inefficiency in our public service, and the administration of justice system. We've taken a strong stand on corruption, especially grand corruption, but there's still a long way to go. Cleaning up systemic corruption is, as you can imagine and as you know, a difficult task. By its very nature, systemic corruption always fights back, using the very institutions that are to be reformed. And I believe that we have to keep focused, we have to keep vigilant and alert, and all and when you require all of the collaboration of the private sector, all of the collaboration of the professions in ensuring that we're able to deliver on the governance issues that so that that have so uh, damaged a lot of the progress that we could, we could have made. I would, uh, as I close, to commend both the NESG and the Ministry of Budget and Planning for the very hard work and consistency through the years. I want to thank you very, very much again for the kind invitation to be here. 
and it's now my distinct pleasure to declare the 24th Nigerian Economic Summit open. Thank you.